All right. So uh, yeah. So last time we have stopped at the definition of a basis of a vector space, uh, which is uh, just a set which is both linearly independent and generates the space V. All right. So um, now uh, we have an alternative characterization of vector spaces. So this is theorem 1.8. A subset of vectors u1 through un of a vector space V is a basis if and only if every vector V in the space uh, capital V uh, can be written uniquely. Yeah, so it's important uniquely in the form V is equal to the sum A1 U1 plus etc plus A N U N for some AI in F. Okay. So every vector is a linear combination of the vectors and the basis. And moreover, uh, it's unique. So there's a unique choice of the coefficients AI. Uh, which represents V in this form, okay? All right. Uh, another observation about basis of a vector space is that uh, they exist. Yeah? So it's very important, of course, <laughs> since we want uh, to apply this. So if a vector space V is generated or spanned by a finite subset, S of V, then some subset of S is a basis of V. Okay, so starting with any uh, generating set, we can always choose a subset which is going to give us a basis. Yeah. Uh, in particular, it follows that uh, every finitely generated vector space has a basis. Yeah. Okay. This is also true for infinite dimensional vector spaces, but uh, in this course, we are not going to discuss infinite dimensional vector spaces. Yeah. So we'll be focusing mostly on uh, finite dimensional spaces. Um, all right. So we have uh, this. And of course, uh, as you are familiar, the important theorem is the replacement theorem here. So that was theorem 1.10. So uh, which allows us to show afterwards that all bases of a given space of a given vector space have the same size. So let V be a vector space generated by a set V, uh, or not V, sorry, G, for example. So a subset of V such that uh, the cardinality, the size of the set G is N. Yeah, natural number n and let l be a linearly independent subset of v and let's say the size of l is m okay so we have uh, two such sets then necessarily we have that m is less or equal than n yeah and there exists h a subset of g such that the size of H is uh, equal to N minus M and such that L together with this new subset H generates V. So it tells us the uh, this is the replacement theorem, yeah? Replacement theorem. So it tells us how we can move uh, vectors from one set into another while preserving this property. Okay, so okay, this is a somewhat technical result, but the whole point of this was uh, the following corollary. So, if V is a finitely generated vector space, then every basis for V has the same number of elements in it. Okay, so all bases have the same size. And now, once we know this, uh, it makes sense to define the dimension of a vector space. 
Okay, so definition. Uh, so uh, if V is a finitely generated vector space, then we define the dimension of this vector space uh, denoted dim V, uh, which we take to be the cardinality, the size, yeah, so we use these words interchangeably, of a basis for V. Okay. And since by uh, the previous uh, corollary, we know that all bases have the same size in the finitely generated vector space, uh, this is well defined, right? So we just get a number, it's an invariant of a space, a number associated to a vector space, which doesn't depend on the choice of the basis in particular. Yeah, okay. So we have dimension, okay? And uh, there are various proper, nice properties of dimension, but the first one which connects uh, subspaces and dimension is the following. So this was theorem 111. Let W be a subspace of V. Uh, so that V is finite dimensional. Then we have that uh, the dimension of the subspace is less or equal than the dimension of uh, the dimension of V. Yeah. So very natural uh, result to expect, since the subspace is something smaller sitting inside the vector space. Uh, and moreover, if we actually have the equality, so if the dimension of W is equal to the dimension of V, then uh, they are actually equal. Yeah. So any proper subspace must have smaller dimension. Yeah. If they have the same dimension, then they are just equal. Okay. So this summarizes several facts about uh, dimension for vector spaces. Uh, so we discussed dimension, we discussed subspaces. The next uh, important topic uh, studied in 115A was, of course, uh, linear transformations. Yeah. So we have this ca category, the uh, class of vector spaces. Now we have to understand uh, how they map to each other. Yes, how they can interact with each other. So for this, of course, we discuss linear transformations. Okay, so let's record some of the facts that we will be using uh, freely when we move on to new topics. Okay, so I hope you remember the definition. So uh, given two vector spaces, V and W, Okay, over the same field F. So I won't mention it from now on, but for all these questions, we assume that uh, both vector spaces are over the same field. Then a linear transformation a linear transformation um, T from V to W is a function. So first of all, it's a function from V to W. Moreover, satisfying the following two conditions. So we want that it preserves the structure of the vector space. Yeah. So the first one is that if I take uh, two vectors, X and Y in V, and I apply the function to their sum, then I get the sum of the applications of T to each of the vectors separately. So this holds for all X, Y in V. This is one. And similarly, we want that uh, this function commutes with scalar multiplication as well. So the first property can sometimes be said as uh, linear transformation commutes with addition in vector spaces. And so the second one is that T uh, of C times X is C times T of X. Okay, so for all vectors X and V and for all scalars C in F, okay? So these are the kind of functions between uh, spaces which preserve the vector space structure in this way. Okay. All right. So of course uh, we know a lot of properties of such maps. So some properties. Remark. Um, so first of all, uh, we have that if t is a linear transformation, then t of zero is equal to zero. Yes, it just follows from the definition. Uh, second, T of any linear combination of vectors 
goes to the corresponding linear combination of the images of these vectors. So we have the same sum ai t of xi for all vectors xi and v and all scalars ai and f. Yeah? So this follows just by uh, iterating the, uh, the properties in the definition. Yeah? Okay. And finally, we have a simple, uh, simpler criterion to test when a linear transform uh, when when a function is a linear transformation. So a function t from uh, v to w is a linear transformation. Okay. If and only if we have that t of c x plus y is equal to c times t of x plus t of y. So we have this condition for all vectors x, y in V, c in f. Yeah. So here we just put uh, both uh, requirements in the definition of linear transformation together into one condition. So in practice, it's usually easy uh, just to write less. Yeah, <laughs> It's usually easier to check this. Uh, but the, as you can see, it's equivalent. All right. So we have this. Now, uh, the first uh, important point about linear transformation was theorem 2.6, uh, which tells us that linear transformations are determined by what they do to a basis. Yeah? So again, assume we have VW, vector spaces, okay, and assume that V1 through Vn is a basis for V, okay, any basis for V, then for any vectors w1 through wn in the other vector space w, there exists exactly one linear transformation t from v to w such that it sends vi to wi for all i between 1 and 10. Okay, so again, to see this, we just need to use the properties uh, in the definition of linear transformation. Once uh, you know that, once you know the, what it does to a certain uh, bunch of vectors, we, it also follows, uh, we can also see where it has to send uh, linear combinations of those vectors, of course, right? By the, the properties in the definition or by the remark. And so, uh, yeah, so linear transformations are completely determined but by what they do to a basis, yeah? This should be a familiar property. All right, uh, so let me move on. Um, now, there are several special kinds of linear transformations, which I recall. Uh, so definition, one, so, well, so let T be uh, from V to W, be a linear transformation. Okay, then we will say that T is injective, If we have that whenever t of v is equal to t of u, then v is equal to u. Yeah. So this holds again for all uh, uv in the vector space v. Okay. So this injectivity. Now we have surjectivity, the dual notion. So t is surjective or onto. Yeah, so you might have seen some synonyms of these words. Uh, so T is surjective if for every W in the vector space W, there exists some V in V such that T of V, oops, T of V is equal to W. Yeah. So every vector in W is the image of some vector in V with respect to T. And finally, uh, T is uh, said to be bijective when it satisfies both of these properties. So if it is injective and surjective, okay? It's the notion of a bijective linear transformation. Yeah. And uh, we know such properties are characterized by uh, properties of certain associated subspaces, which I'm going to remind now. So this is the null space and uh, range, yeah? So assume we have uh, VW vector spaces, 
and t from v to w, a linear transformation. Okay. Then, first of all, we have the null space of t or the kernel of t. You might have seen either of these words. So the null space of t uh, is defined, well, is denoted, first of all, n of t. And this consists of all those vectors x and v, such that t of x is 0. Yeah. So these are all vectors in v which go to 0. OK, we also have the dual notion. So the range of t is the image of v under t. It is denoted r of t. So this consists of all y and w such that y is of the form t of x for some x and v. Okay, so this is the range or the image sometimes. So people use different, uh, these two synonyms sometimes, okay? So as the name suggests, these are both spaces. Yeah, so we, uh, so this is okay. Um, we have theorem, 2.1, so both n of t, uh, well, n of t is a subspace of V, and R of t is a subspace of W, okay? So we have these two important spaces, uh, subspaces associated to a linear map. And a lot of information about the, the linear map Linear transformation can be understood from the properties of the subspaces, of course. So for this, we have theorem to four. Um, so we have T is injective, if and only if the null space of T is zero, yeah? And T is surjective, if and only if the range of T is the whole space W. Yeah, so this is theorem 2.4. Uh, and we also have um, um, a very important result which connects uh, the dimensions of these two spaces. So this is theorem 2.3. It's also called the dimension theorem. Sometimes it is called the rank nullity theorem, depending on which sources you have seen. Yeah, so the dimension theorem. Given any vector spaces VW uh, and T, a linear map from V to W or a linear transformation, uh, and assume also that the dimension of V is uh, finite, okay? Then we have the following formula. So the dimension of V, the whole space, is given by the dimension of uh, the null space of T plus the dimension of the range of T. So we have uh, this formula, uh, which connects uh, the dimension of these two subspaces uh, with the dimension of the space V itself, okay? The dimension theorem or the rank nullity theorem. All right, so uh, we have this, and we also have theorem 2.5, which tells us that uh, in the same situation, so again, let Oops, assume that uh, T the theorem, uh, sorry, assume that T is a linear transformation uh, from V to W, okay? So assume, moreover, that they have the same dimension. So assume that the dimension of V is equal to the dimension of W, okay? Then the following are equivalent. One, T is injective. Two, T is surjective, three, T is bijective, and four, the dimension of the range of T is equal to the dimension of V, okay? So we have all these equivalent conditions, but very importantly, under the assumption that the dimension of V is the same as the dimension of W, yeah? So all these uh, claims can be derived uh, from, uh, well, they're all corollaries of the dimension theorem, essentially. Uh, 
it will be especially important when we talk about uh, linear maps from V to itself. Yeah, because then this condition that the dimension of V uh, is equal to the dimension of W will be automatically satisfied. And so we'll know that all this uh, all these uh, conditions on the linear transformations are equivalent. Okay. So, all right. So, uh, any questions about uh, this part so far? Okay. So, if not, um, let me move on. Yeah. So, the next point. Uh, so, we have defined now linear transformations between vector spaces. A very important fact is that the linear transformations themselves form a vector space. Yeah. So we see that somehow the uh, the same theory can be applied, in fact, to study the maps between vector spaces as well. So here we recall the vector space of linear transformations, which would denote as L, curly L of VW. Okay. So definition. Assume as usual VW vector spaces over F T uh, U. Well, okay, excuse me. Uh, so T and capital U are two linear transformations from V to W. Okay. Then we can define functions which would denote as t plus u and also a times t for every a in f uh, by the following. So we say that the value of the function t plus u on a vector x is given by the value of t on x plus the value of u on x. So for all x uh, in V. And similarly, we define uh, the value of the function a times t on x to be a times t of x for all x and v. Okay. So you see, in this way, we define two functions uh, from v to w again. And an important fact about this definition. So this is theorem 2.7, is that if both T and U are linear transformations, then the functions T plus U and A times U are also linear transformations from uh, the vector space V to the vector space W, okay? So this way we see that we can actually add function, add linear transformations and multiply them by scalars, yeah? But this suggests that we have a structure of a vector space on the linear transformations themselves, right? So towards this definition, uh, so we'll let curly L of VW be the set of all linear transformations from v, uh, v to u, uh, to w, excuse me, yeah. Then L of Vw is itself a vector space over the same field F as uh, V and W, okay? With respect to the operations, Defined above. Yeah. So given two linear transformations, we know how to find another linear transformation, which we define to be the sum of them. And similarly, uh, for a product by scalar. Okay. And uh, also when V is equal to W, yeah, so when both uh, vector spaces are the same, then we write simply L of V instead of L of V, V, 
Yeah. So L of V is just linear transformations from V to itself. And it's equipped with the vector space structure. Okay. All right. So, so far we see this is just a vector space. Uh, the next point, a very important point of linear algebra, is that these linear transformations can be described by matrices. So we have some kind of explicit uh, num numeric descriptions of such linear transformations. Yeah. So for this, we discuss matrix representations of a linear transformation. So recall definition, uh, when V is a vector space of finite dimension, so dimension V is less than infinity, then an ordered basis, an ordered basis uh, for V, <laughs> okay, so is a basis, as the name suggests, for V, uh, with a specified ordering on its vectors. Okay. So not only we care about the actual set of vectors in this basis, but we also care about the order in which we pick them. Vectors. Okay. Yeah. So nothing deep here, just a basis with a fixed ordering. It's important when we start describing uh, linear transformations as matrices, uh, the matrix is written in some order, right? There's like left on your page and there's right. So this is going to correspond basically to that. Just, yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So now let's recall the definition of a matrix representation. So, definition. So, assume we have beta, an ordered basis, and let's write it like V1 through Vn, for example. So let beta be an ordered basis for V. Okay. Then we know that any vector V, uh, or let's say X in the space V, uh, can be written uniquely. Yeah, remember, uniquely um, as x is equal to the sum a1 v1 plus etc plus a n v1 vn uh, for some scalars some unique choice of the scalars a1 through a n in f right so this is remarked earlier this is true for any vector with respect to a given basis okay then we define the coordinate vector of X relative to this basis beta, which we denote as X in square brackets, subscript beta. So this is the vector consisting of the elements A1, A2, etc., A n. So it's a vector of length n where each element is a scalar, right? So then it's a vector in the space F to the n, right? Okay, yeah. So for each vector, uh, we have a representation with respect to a basis as a vector of scalars. And this is denoted by this uh, square brackets beta. All right. Uh, so now each vector has some presentation of this form with respect to beta. And uh, using this, we can start talking about how these presentations change when we apply linear transformations to them. Okay. So let VW b vector spaces with ordered basis beta for v so this is v1 through vn and gamma for w so let's write a w1 through wm so possibly different dimensions of v and w respectively yeah so beta is a basis, ordered basis for V, gamma is an ordered basis for W. And let T be a linear transformation from V to W. Okay. Then the matrix representation of T of T with respect to these two ordered bases, beta gamma, okay, 
So all of this uh, data, given all this data, then this matrix representation is defined as the matrix, which is uh, denoted square brackets T, and then we have to specify beta and gamma. Okay, so note here that uh, we write at the bottom the, uh, the origin, so uh, basis for V and then gamma. So you can think about it like we have a map, T is a map from beta to gamma, yeah? So, uh, yeah, but okay, let me erase all of this, not to complicate the notation. So, uh, so we're, uh, this is a matrix, okay. First of all, what are the dimensions of this matrix? So this is a matrix of dimension M by N over F, okay? Given by the following, so this matrix T beta gamma consists of uh, columns where each column correspond to the uh, presentation of the vector T of V1 with respect to gamma. The second column is T of V2, its representation with respect to gamma, etc all the way to T of VN, presentation with respect to gamma, okay? Where, uh, let me just uh, expand what I just said. So T of VI with respect to gamma is a vector consisting of the coordinates of the vector T of VI, so it's a vector in W, because T goes to W, yeah? With respect to uh, the basis gamma, ordered basis gamma. Yeah. So it's the, in the sense of the previous definition. And uh, finally, to simplify the notation, if V is equal to W, yeah, so if the map is from V to itself, and if beta is equal to gamma, then we simply write uh, square brackets T beta. Okay. So I hope you remember this notation. If not, uh, you should refresh it. Yeah. So, okay. So this way, given a linear transformation, we associate a matrix to it. Yeah. And now we have to uh, recall some properties of this uh, of this association. So we see that matrices interact, uh, matrix representations reflect nicely the properties of the linear transformations, which they represent. So the main theorem here is the following, theorem 2.8. Uh, so assume VW are finite dimensional vector spaces with ordered basis, uh, beta and gamma, okay? And assume we have two linear transformations. So T U from V to W, linear transformations, okay? Then we have this nice correspondence uh, between uh, the ma matrix representations and the transformations. So first of all, we have that U is equal to T as a map, yeah? So meaning that they are identical maps, if and only if uh, the matrices are equal. So the matrix of U with respect to beta gamma is equal to the matrix of T with respect to beta gamma. So equality of matrices corresponds to the equality of the linear transformations. Two. If you take the linear transformation T plus U and we look at its matrix representation, then it is given by the sum of two matrices where the first matrix is the presentation uh, uh, corresponding to T and the second matrix uh, is the matrix representation of U, okay? So we see that addition commutes uh, with this uh, correspondence. And similarly for scalar multiplication, so if I look at the linear transformation A times T, 
and uh, we consider its matrix, then it is obtained as A times the matrix T beta gamma. And this holds for all uh, scalars A and S. Okay. So we have this uh, nice properties of this uh, matrix presentations. Now, uh, of course, when you have maps between different uh, vector spaces, sometimes you want to compose them. Yeah? So sometimes given a map from V to W and then from W to Z, you want to be able to uh, consider the composition. And this composition is what motivates matrix multiplication the way it is defined usually by, by an explicit formula, okay? So uh, for this, we have the following definition. I just recall what I mean by composition. So let V, W, Z be vector spaces over some field of scalars F. Let T from V to W and U from W to Z be linear transformations. Okay. Then their composition is defined to be the function which we denote as u times t. Uh, let me write it on, on a new line actually. So we denote it as uh, is the function u t. Yeah, this is a function from v to z. And it is defined by successively applying the two functions. So it is defined by uh, the value of this function ut of x is first you apply t and then you apply u for all x in v. Okay, so this makes sense uh, because uh, of uh, the spaces on which these functions are defined, yeah, because t is from v to w and then u is from w to z. So then the composition goes from V to Z. Okay, so we have composition, the usual notion of composition of uh, functions. And uh, theorem 2.9 tells us that uh, if T and U are both linear, then the composition UT is also linear, is also a linear transformation. Okay, so composition of linear transformations is itself a linear transformation. All right. And so now uh, we know that this can be associated to products of matrices. So if you're trying to determine the matrix representation of the composition of two linear transformations, this corresponds exactly to the product of the uh, matrix representations. So this was theorem 211, which I recall. So assume we have the situation V, W, Z are finite dimensional vector spaces. Well, okay, let me write it carefully. So let V, W, Z be a vector, uh, excuse me, be vector spaces over F. Uh, and we fix some ordered basis, yeah? So with ordered basis, for example, alpha, beta, gamma, respectively. Yeah. And assume we have uh, a linear transformation T from V to W. And we also have a linear transformation U from W to Z. Okay, so these are linear transformations. Then if I look at the uh, matrix representing the composition of these two linear transformations with respect to the basis alpha and gamma, because remember uh, composition goes now from V to Z, yeah, so the corresponding basis are alpha and gamma. So in order to calculate this matrix, what we do is take the product of the corresponding matrices for U and T, okay? But uh, so we need to check the basis. So T goes from alpha to beta, right? And U goes from beta to gamma. And so because of this, you see that the dimensions are aligned. So the product of these two matrices actually makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So we see that uh, composition of linear transformation corresponds precisely to matrix multiplication. And so uh, corollary of this is that uh, 
if uh, V vector space with finite dimension and uh, let's fix an ordered basis beta, assume we have two linear transformations uh, from V to itself. So let me write them as T and U, uh, two linear transformations. So elements of L of V. Then uh, the matrix representing the composition with respect to the basis beta is simply the product of the matrix represent, matrices representing U and T uh, with respect to beta. Yeah. So this corollary is just a special case of theorem 211 applied to the situation when uh, all of the three vector spaces, uh, V, W, Z, are all uh, equal to V. So they are all the same space. All right. So we have this. Um, now, another point here is uh, that it's possible to also to calculate uh, the coordinates of a vector uh, when we apply a linear transformation to it. So let me just remind, this was theorem 214 in 115a. So assume we have V and W, finite dimensional vector spaces with ordered basis beta and gamma, okay? And assume T from V to W is a linear transformation Okay, then for all vectors V, uh, or let's say vectors U in uh, the space V, we have that if I apply my linear transformation T to U, and I look at the uh, corresponding presentation of this vector in W, then this is the same as looking at the coordinate representation of U, with respect to beta, and now we want to apply T to it, right? But this corresponds to multiplying by the matrix uh, representation of T with respect to beta and gamma. Okay, so what it tells us that we can calculate the coordinates of the vector T of U from the coordinates of the vector U. Uh, and to, in order to calculate it, we can just multiply by the matrix representing the linear transformation. Okay, all right. So this is, <clears throat> excuse me, this is some important properties of matrix representations. Um, let me, uh, okay, let me take a little pause here. So if there are any questions about this. And like I said before, yes, yeah, so if you want to see the details of these facts, uh, you can either look it up in the book or you can see the lecture notes that I've uploaded on Canvas for 115A. Uh, if you need to refresh some of this material. All right. Uh, and so now one more topic we need to discuss before moving on to uh, new material is uh, invertibility. Okay, so invertibility, both for matrices and for linear transformations. So definition. Assume we have VW vector spaces and T from V to W, a linear transformation. Okay. Uh, then one, uh, we say that a linear transformation U from W to V. So note it goes in the opposite direction. Yeah. T goes from U to W, uh, from V to W, excuse me, and U goes from W to V. So we say that such a linear transformation is uh, the inverse of T, okay? If we have that in whichever order we compose these two uh, transformations, we always get the identity map. So uh, the composition in, in the order UT gives us the identity on V. And if we compose in the opposite order, so we consider TU, then we get the identity on W. Okay, so I recall that I, uh, IV is just denotes the identity map 
So this is the map uh, that sends uh, x to x for all x in V. Okay. All right. So it's a map which somehow undoes what the other map did, no matter in what order you compose them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we have this. And uh, we will say that the linear transformation T is invertible if it has an inverse. So if there exists some U with uh, as in one. Okay. All right. So the, once we have this notion, uh, we would like to understand when it's actually possible to uh, to invert a linear transformation. Yeah. So we had some results for this in 115a. So some basic facts first. Remark. Uh, one. If t is invertible, then its inverse is unique. So the, if, if there such a U, as in this definition exists for a given T, then uh, it's the only one. There's only one, there can be only one map satisfying this, uh, this condition, okay? And since it's unique, we will denote it as T inverse or T, T to the power minus one yeah. by analogy with the inverse for uh, multiplication, okay? So then, second remark is that T is invertible if and only if T is a bijection. Okay. So we have this characterization in terms of the uh, property we have considered earlier being a bijection. And uh, then we have the following lemma which connects, uh, well, which gives us some information about the dimension in this situation. So let T from V to W be linear and invertible. And assume that the dimension of the space V is finite, okay? Then we have that the dimension of V is equal to the dimension of W. So if we have a linear transformation between two vector spaces, which is invertible, equivalently, which is a bijection, uh, then the dimensions must match, okay? So this is a necessary condition uh, for the existence of an invertible map then, uh, for the existence sorry, of the inverse map, that the dimensions uh, are the same, okay? Now we have a similarly a notion of invertibility for matrices. So definition, because we have this philosophy that matrices correspond to linear transformations. So we can say that the matrix um, A of some given dimensions, so N by N matrix over some field F is invertible. Okay, so a matrix is invertible. If there exists some other matrix B also uh, of dimension N by N, such that if we take the product of these two matrices in any order, we get the identity matrix, okay? Now just recall the identity matrix is the matrix which has ones on the diagonal and zeros everywhere else, okay? Which is exactly the matrix representation of the uh, identity linear map from a space to itself, okay? And let me finish with uh, today's uh, discussion with theorem 218, which uh, tells us that uh, invertibility of linear transformations corresponds to invertibility of their matrices. Yeah? So if we have VW, finite dimensional vector spaces with ordered basis beta and gamma respectively, okay? And if T is a linear transformation from V to W, okay, then we have that the linear transformation T is invertible if and only if the matrix representing T, so the matrix 
representing T with respect to this choice of beta gamma is invertible. Okay. And moreover, we can actually calculate the in matrix of the inverse. So I uh, let T, T inverse be the linear transformation, uh, which is the inverse of T. So we can ask about its matrix representation. Note that the bases go in the opposite order. So now, because it's now a map from a W to V. Okay, then this matrix is uh, given by considering the matrix of T itself and taking its inverse matrix. Yeah. So we have that in inversion on matrices and on uh, linear transformations correspond to each other. Okay, so we have this correspondence. Okay, uh, so let me stop here uh, for today. Uh, yeah, if, if, uh, the time is up, so you can uh, feel free to leave now. But if also if you want to ask some question, you can. Or uh, actually, better is to you can come to the office hours later today, from uh, three thirty to uh, to five. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Th yeah. Thanks everyone for your attention. So uh, I hope this uh, you know re reminds a few things, <laughs> puts you in the mindset for all this. Uh, for some of these notions that uh, were covered in 115a that we will need, uh, we'll be using soon. All right, yeah, thanks everyone. So.